This month on Focus Black Oklahoma. Hear from the leaders of Aware Oklahoma and OU's Anti-Racist Seminar, who are closing gaps in anti-racist education. Learn about the state's early migrants from the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Jamie Glisson speaks with Congressional District 4 candidates, incumbent Congressman Tom Cole, and his opponent Mary Brannon in our third installment of the series. A Tulsa arts organization makes big moves into a historic building where youth can share the stage once graced by the greats. And the dynamics of a father and son hiking trip become a complicated and hilarious encounter. All this and more on Focus Black Oklahoma. Focus Black Oklahoma is sponsored by Philip Seminary with video of the Tulsa Race Massacre annual lectureship from the author of Lynched, The Power of Memory in a Culture of Terror. Online at ptstulsa.edu slash lectures. This is Focus Black Oklahoma. I'm Kuma Roberts. Focus Black Oklahoma's Lydia Zhang met with leaders who are closing gaps in anti-racist education by encouraging Oklahomans to talk about issues relating to race and discrimination. Here's more about Aware Tulsa and the University of Oklahoma's Anti-Racist Rhetoric and Pedagogy Seminar. The bright red state of Oklahoma is one that struggles to acknowledge and support anti-racist and anti-discriminatory principles. Schools and workplaces rarely provide built-in or intentional spaces for learning that are available for youth and adults alike. There are two initiatives in Norman and Tulsa that currently provide or recently offered these spaces to fill the gaps in anti-racist learning and community. Kelly Pyron Alvarez is an assistant teaching professor at the University of Oklahoma who has previously provided learning opportunities to close anti-racist gaps that she sees in her students. She created a seminar with two other OU faculty members called Anti-Racist Rhetoric and Pedagogies due to witnessing students discriminate against one another. With my students especially, because I mean, I'm getting them their first year in college. So they're 17, 18, 19. They mimic what their parents think. I don't know that they fully understand some of these things sometimes, but then there's not a lot of education on white supremacy and racial issues in the state anyway. I had had some issues with students in the past saying absolutely horrible things. Like I no longer do peer review in my classes because students abuse peer review. I had one student, um, for example, comment on somebody else's paper, and this was several years ago, that I don't know if you're gay or not, but if you are, you shouldn't be. When institutions don't provide spaces to discuss and break down discrimination and anti-racism, Pyron Alvarez says harmful biases show up in pervasive ways, regardless of age. If we don't talk about racism and if we don't talk about white supremacy and if we don't work to understand what these concepts are and how they impact us, then we can't disrupt the systems that utilize them. We can't create systems that no longer produce harm. So we have to talk about it. And Oklahomans are really not wanting to talk about it. Hannah Jarman is a white woman and a vision team member of Aware Tulsa, an organization that seeks to empower and activate white Tulsans to support communities of color and to be effective agents of anti-racism. She shares the mission and intent of Aware Tulsa's origins as an anti-racist community organization for white people. Aware Tulsa was started in 2015 after the killing of Eric Harris by the Tulsa Police Department. Um, there was an understanding by the founders that there's a deep and urgent work that was needed for white people, white Tulsans specifically. Our new program, Aware Tulsa 101, is intended to bring white Tulsans together to discuss issues of race and explore what it would take to shift white culture in Tulsa. So. 
we realize that it's actually less about, you know, we can talk about history, we can talk about politics, but the reality is that like we need interpersonal change within white Tolsons and white culture specifically to shift away from white supremacy and towards anti-racism. As a facilitator, Hannah believes that learning and building community with white folks and by white folks is crucial for holistic growth. My favorite pieces about the program is the ability to question each other. Oftentimes we see multiple group, you know, obviously multiple groups of white people with different perceptions on race. Some believe that they have read enough, they've done the work, like they've met the finish line, especially post-2020 with, you know, the summer of racial reckoning. A lot of people picked up a lot of books and they're like, I've got it. Or some people went to a school that was racially diverse. I've got it. I get it. You know, we've got kind of that group, right? We've also got um, a group that like, you know, what the believe it's unnecessary to kind of do any work regardless, right? And then you, you have this group that's comfortable not thinking about race at all. Even these small moments of challenging each other, pushing each other um, is really important to me. And that's been happening throughout, even if like there's a scenario we want to discuss where we don't have to, you know, bring in a member of the BIPOC community and ask them those questions, which we know can be like incredibly, you know, burdensome to them. Achieving racial equity in Tulsa will only start when individuals take up reflective and personal work to confront the ways that white supremacy is conditioned. If white people are not questioning why they are defensive when someone calls them in on a conversation, we will never move forward. Um, I could, you know, you could justify your actions all day long. You know, personally, I could sit here and say, well, you know, I was intending to do this and I, yeah. uh, that wasn't what I meant. And, you know, X, Y, Z things, we get so caught up in like our own pride um, that sometimes we fall into guilt, shame, defensiveness. And if, if we're not even hitting that problem first, we're never going to be able to actually be able to organize. Aware Tulsa aims to provide spaces for this personal work. Individual change is the crucial step before community-wide change can happen. If we could help white Tulsans figure out what an anti-racist white identity could look like and how we could act upon that, and then be able to effectively organize and effectively have policy change and effectively uh, like communicate with BIPOC organizations and communities that would just m make this work and make this movement so much smoother, but also just so much more effective. Um, so that's really why I think that Tulsa specifically need this program. Community-based organizations like Aware Tulsa are creating programs to close the gaps for anti-racist education while providing safe and collective learning spaces for white folks. White Tulsans who are interested in Aware Tulsa can find resources and sign up to participate in their next cohort beginning at the end of August. Follow their Facebook page at Aware Tulsa. For Focus, Black Oklahoma, I'm Lydia Jung in Tulsa. Many Oklahomans are unaware of the state's early migrants from the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. This often underrepresented community has long been a part of Oklahoma history. Anthony Cherry shares their story. When Oklahoma Territory's two million acres of unassigned land were opened for settlement in 1889, thousands of homesteaders from multicultural backgrounds and locations rushed to stake their claim on these indigenous lands. That highly competitive influx of migrants also brought a small handful of Chinese and Japanese migrants who managed to establish roots in early Oklahoma history. When Oklahoma later became a state in 1907, 75 Chinese and four Japanese people were officially recorded on the census. All of them were men. Unfortunately, it is not common knowledge that Chinese immigrants journeyed to Indian and Oklahoma territories as early as the mid-1800s, decades before the land run. 
In the 1850s and 1860s, many Chinese immigrants came to America seeking political refuge from the collapse of the Manchu dynasty, the last ruling dynasty of China. Beginning with the gold rush in 1848, larger numbers of Chinese immigrants made their way to America seeking safety and economic prosperity. They primarily settled in California. Chinese labor became iconic for making significant contributions to the development of the American West and the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. As the nation fell into a severe economic depression in the 1870s, anti-Chinese sentiments grew. Chinese communities were thriving economically, while many poor whites struggled. Under intense public pressure, Congress began passing a series of anti-Chinese immigration legislation. Political deterioration, combined with the massive famine in China, did not help the situation. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was a congressional bill aimed to stop virtually all Chinese laborers from immigrating to the United States. There are very few exceptions. Teachers, wealthy merchants, and their sons were excluded. Chinese immigrants belonging to the labor class remaining in the country were subject to search, detention, and deportation. The explicit purpose of this legislation was to eliminate Chinese competition with white labor. The 1850 census showed that 4,018 men lived in San Francisco with just seven Chinese women. Initially, Chinese cultural expectations prevented many Chinese women from coming to the U.S., but ultimately, the United States Congress passed legislation called the Page Laws limiting Chinese women from immigrating to the United States. By 1882, only one in 400 Chinese immigrants were female. Page laws were designed to prevent the solidification of Chinese families and communities in the United States. When the railroad work dwindled due to the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad and anti-Chinese legislation, a handful of these now illegal immigrant workers made their way to Oklahoma disguised as Mexicans and Native Americans. They were looking for their share in the economic development of Oklahoma pre-statehood. Some historians suggest that thousands of illegal Chinese workers were smuggled across the Mexican border, with hundreds of these undocumented workers actually making it to what was then called Oklahoma Territory and Indian Territory, then also known as the Twin Territories. A group of powerful Chinese merchants created an organization called the Six Companies that would eventually monopolize Chinese human trafficking. For this reason, many Chinese Oklahomans remained intentionally undocumented. Census records are unreliable, making it difficult for historians to provide sound assertions of just how many Chinese and Japanese immigrants helped build Oklahoma society from the mud. Outbreaks of anti-Chinese violence forced many people underground in a figurative and sometimes a literal sense. There are rumors of underground cities across the country, including Oklahoma City. The Chinese Exclusion Act loomed over their heads as Chinese immigrants optimistically attempted to carve a mostly undocumented life in Oklahoma. Today, much like their predecessors, Oklahomans of Asian American Pacific Islander or AAPI backgrounds are continuing to carve out a life for themselves despite significant contemporary social challenges. Dr. Singing Edens is a Chinese immigrant currently living and teaching in Tulsa. I'm a Chinese instructor at Honglong Hao, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'm also a director of uh, Oklahoma Chinese Language Institute. In my spare time, I um, volunteer as a chair of a Beihai Sister City Partnership in Tulsa Global uh, Alliance, and I 
also、uh, work as a reviewer of K twelve Chinese language teaching at USA Chinese Language Teachers Association. I'm also a writer of AP Chinese and writer of elementary education certification at E E T S. Hailing from Northern China, Dr. Edens has worked extremely hard to establish herself as not only a servant of Oklahoma's AAPI communities, but also as an advocate. I think the biggest concern, biggest challenge that the、uh, Chinese people face right now is the Asian hate due to the lack of understanding of Asian culture. Asian hate is nothing new. Much like the 1870s. AAPI citizens experience economic uncertainty, mixed with heightened racism and xenophobia, which have created potentially hostile environments. Dr. Edens went on to add that some people just turn their ignorance into fear and hate.、Uh, Asian Americans have been the the scapegoat for unemployment. Involution and COVID in the past several years, hate behaviors and、uh, violent crimes against Asian Americans were in- increased significantly in the U.S.、Um, in Tulsa, it's lucky that、uh, we don't have that、uh, obvious、um, violence. But Asian hate can be something hidden behavior, including verbal harassment, shining avoidance, physical. Assault. So, anti-Haitian behaviors can be verbal harassment, even shining and avoidance,、uh, physical assault, coughing, spitting, eye rolling, even you know the mean gestures such as pulling your eyes toward different angles. And I have experienced that in my in in my teaching experience. So you can imagine how hard it will be for other Asians in other fields. Examples of this anti-AAPI violence include economic ostracization, racist graffiti and vandalism, physical assaults, and verbal threats. Rex Burnett is the director of the East Asia Institute at the University of Oklahoma. You know, I, I think we're all part of the same system. You know, we're all human beings. You know, I, I personally don't. I believe that we're just different cultures. And that we've developed at, at different times and and have different, you know, different ways of doing things. But I think in order to not only gain compassion and empathy and understand words that are going around like equity,、mm. you know, we have to understand that people are people. If you go to China tomorrow, or if you went to the Middle East tomorrow, you would see families that care dearly about their children, that are trying to make a living. If you go to Africa, it's the same thing. That's what people are trying to do in life, and so the problem we have is that the people that have the biggest voices are usually politicians.、Mm. So you have the Chinese government and the U.S. government with the biggest heads that are talking, and the people like us, you know, the common person or the educators, the intellects, and other people that you know should also have a voice. Former President Donald Trump repeatedly referred to COVID-19 as the Chinese virus or Kung Flu. This targeting of the Chinese as dubious proliferators of the coronavirus has been deemed racist by many, and a way of scapegoating an entire demographic of people in America, many of whom are American citizens. But it is not just Chinese Americans being scapegoated, but all Chinese. Begin、uh, by announcing some important developments in our war against the Chinese virus. We'll be invoking the Defense Production Act just in case we need it. Why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? There are reports of dozens of incidents of bias against Chinese Americans in this country. Your own aide, Secretary Azar, says he does not use this term. He says ethnicity does not cause the virus. Why do you keep using this? A lot of people say it's、China. racist. It's not racist at all. No, not at all. It comes from China. That's why. Comes from China. I、you、want to be accurate. Yeah, please, John. Please. You. Are、um, you I have a great, I have great love、uh, for all of the people from our country. But、uh, as you know, China tried to say at one point, maybe they stopped now, that it was caused by American soldiers. That can't happen. It's not going to happen. Not as long as I'm president. 
uh, it comes from China. Do you think using the term Chinese virus that puts Asian Americans at risk that people no, might target them? All. No, 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 no. I think they probably uh, would agree with it 100 percent. It comes from China. In March of 2020, John Curran, Republican senator from Texas, commented. Well, I think China is to blame because they're, the culture where people eat bats and snakes and dogs and things like that, these viruses are transmitted from the animal to the people. And that's why China has been the source of a lot of these viruses like SARS, like MERS, the swine flu. Words matter tremendously in these high stakes situations. Our national values are also called to the center of the world stage. What message does this type of language send regarding national values? Teaching young children the crucial importance of language, community, and the value of Chinese culture has been paramount in the work of Dr. Edens and Mr. Burnett. Much of the community building work of both involves education and supporting young people in the AAPI communities of Oklahoma. First, we hear from Dr. Edens, then Mr. Burnett. I am not quite sure whether I can speak for our generation, for our group of people. So um, if uh, there, there are some negativities uh, in, in the past history, they, they like to either hide it or they feel it is so painful to talk about it, especially you know, Chinese still have the feeling that they are not the uh, the citizen, even though we have the citizens on the book, right, uh, in the U.S. So I think what you did, what you are doing right now is to talk about, to teach us the history of Chinese and Japanese in Oklahoma that will bring awareness of the younger generation to tell them, hey, it is okay to look back, retrospect what has happened. And uh, even though it is painful, we still need to face it. We need to accept it. And also, yes, it is important for us to move on. But what we have achieved right now is built on the generations and generations contribution in the past. In, in among those uh, contributions, Chinese people play a big part, big part of it. We need to, uh, I know that we have the museum, we have Chinese museum, we have a monument somewhere, very small part of the history um, size. We really need to build them, enlarge them. Part of what we do at the East Asia Institute at, here at OU, or at OU is we, pro we provide um, professional development to help um, teachers integrate East Asian languages and cultures into their curriculum. Um, and what we're finding and what I found personally is when I started studying and looking at how can we meet their needs and look at what the actual things that are being taught, there was next to nothing. And if it was something, it was something negative. Dr. Edens and Mr. Burnett both emphasized the importance of recognizing the robust contributions of Chinese culture to the tapestry of Oklahoma society. Again, here's Burnett. Well, some of the main programs that we have, what, what, what we realized in 20 something years ago, Dr. Jessica Stoll was the original director and she started all of this. And uh, then there was Dr. Claudia Forehand who came after her and, and then me. And so what they started doing is working with schools like Jinx. Jinx Immersion came um, as a result of a collaboration with our organization and the people at Jinx that had a vision on um, establishing a good Chinese program. And so what we have now, even with all the backlash with China, it's kind of amazing to me some of the support that we have. Like we have an after school program at Carnegie Elementary um, that we have right now. We do summer camps one at OU, and, and we have one ongoing right now at Carnegie Elementary, which is a combination of Salk, Grissom, and Carnegie Elementary students. As Oklahoma's House Bill 1775 aims to neutralize the teaching of critical race theory and various diversity and inclusion programs in public learning institutions, certain oppressed cultural histories may be in danger of erasure. Our guests today, Dr. Singing Edens and Rex Burnett, emphasize the importance of multiple perspectives, common values, and strong community building while injecting empathy 
and a sense of justice in Oklahoma's pursuit of understanding one another while creating a safer place for all of our children. For Focus, Black Oklahoma, I'm Anthony Cherry in Tulsa. In our third installment of our series exploring candidates running for political office across the state, Jamie Glisson speaks with Congressional District 4 candidates, incumbent Congressman Tom Cole, and his opponent, Mary Brannon. It isn't often that a state within our country can be represented by someone with so much historical and family lineage as Oklahoma has with Congressman Tom Cole. Representative Cole is a fifth-generation Oklahoman a member of the Chickasaw Nation, descendant of the famous Mary Frances Thompson Fisher, better known as Te Ata, and the son of Helen Cole, a member of the Chickasaw Hall of Fame, and she served as a state senator, mayor of Moore, and was the first Native American woman elected to the Oklahoma House of Representatives. Cole is currently serving his 10th term as congressman to Oklahoma's 4th District. He was first elected to the United States House of Representatives in 2002 and earlier this year became the longest serving Native American in the history of Congress. His opponent this November is Mary Brannon, a school counselor and teacher that served the children of Purcell Independent School District for nearly 25 years. Brannon has challenged Cole in two previous elections and in 2018 she received over 90,000 votes the most a Democratic opponent has received in that district race. Here's Mary explaining why she decided to run a third time. I decided to run against Tom Cole because I was teaching in a rural school and we have a weekly newspaper and he had a column once a week and he just wasn't truthful. And so uh, I would write letters to the editor and I would be very, um, I said he had, uh, was confused. <laughs> I never said he wasn't telling the truth because he was going to vote against Obamacare and he didn't have anything else to put in its place. And I told him, if you vote against Obamacare, you're going to have a, a formidable opponent next time you're on. I'm really excited this time because I'm hoping that um, because of Roe v. Wade, which to me is just um, awful, that they would let a 10 year old have her rapist baby. They would not let a 10-year-old babysit for them. When asked about how Oklahoma's gun laws stacked up to the rest of the nation and if they would change anything on a federal level, the candidates were on opposite sides of the issue. Here is Congressman Tom Cole on gun violence legislation. I don't spend a lot of time looking at the state laws anymore since I'm not a state official, but I have a pretty good idea where I think my constituents are uh, on this issue. There's no question that uh, this is a, part of the country where folks are highly familiar with firearms. They're part of the culture. Uh, where it actually, uh, years ago, I think I, I happened to make the statement uh, that, like, in my view, one out of every two households in my district had a legal firearm. And that, that like, caused a flurry at the Washington Post. And uh, they said, well, well, how do you know that? Well, I know my district. Look, I grew up here. I lived in the district uh, uh, you know, most of my life, really, my family's lived here for over 170 years, literally inside the current confines of the district. So I think I have a pretty good idea of, uh, you know, what what people think here. And that's uh, part of the culture. It's a place that uh, firearms are used for hunting. Then I think a lot of people are genuinely concerned, particularly in rural areas, about what the response time of police is to get to them. They're not going to be there in three minutes if you're out for Rica or in rural Jefferson County or someplace like that. So it's a it's an important element for a lot of people of self-defense. It's part of the culture they grew up with. I remember doing a series of meetings at schools in rural areas after Sandy Hook. And honestly, you know, again, a lot of these kids grew up hunting. And uh, they were more worried that Washington would pass legislation that would somehow either confiscate weapons that they already owned or uh, make it possible for them to get things and they were worried about their personal safety. So, uh, you know, most of the federal legislation 
even when you get something relatively mild, like we had three or four weeks ago, and I certainly supported the additional money for mental health, the additional money uh, for parties, all that stuff's fine. But once you start actually uh, going after what, what, you know, they're called assault weapons, they're not, and AR-15 is a semi-automatic, it's a pretty popular platform. We know there's at least 24 million uh, legally owned inside the United States. Uh, and you're talking about eliminating those or uh, allowing people that have them now to keep them, but putting, uh, you know, restrictions on their ability to uh, transfer them to family and friends or uh, their ability to purchase them. In other words, saying what you got, keep, but no more could be sold. You really are getting on a slippery slope as far as most of my constituents are concerned, particularly people that vote on the issue, that this is a motivating force for them. So again, I, I, I see it really as more of a, of a, uh, a regional and cultural issue uh, that different parts of the country feel different ways. I mean, uh, there's not a profound difference between Republicans and Democrats within the state of Oklahoma on this issue in the same way there would be in Washington, D.C. Congressman Cole stated that the National Rifle Association has given the members of our House of Representatives an A rating. Mary Brannon currently has an F. Here is Mary with her take on gun violence legislation. Yes, I would change something at the federal level. When you've got mass shootings like you have in Texas, 19 students and two teachers, we need to get the AR-15 banned again like it was when Clinton was in office. I don't think people understand what happens when you get hit by an AR-15 bullet. It, it explodes. Some of these little kids at in Texas, they had to have their parents come in because their faces were just blown off. How can we do that? How can we accept that? And then on top of that, Look at around us. Look at other countries. They don't have these problems we have. Why are we having these? We need to look inside our policies why we are having so many mass shootings. If we have people who have mental illness, they should not have a gun or they should at least have a, a three day wait. You shouldn't be able to buy an AR-15 at 18 when you can't even buy a beer. <laughs> you know, I mean, but some at some point, these Republicans have to look in the mirror and say, maybe I need to vote differently. If they're going to have 19 kids shot that they have been so defaced, they have got to have the parents come in and do a DNA test. Maybe there needs to be something done. On the topic of CD4 constituents and their interests, Congressman Cole mentioned the support of the military facilities and the civilian jobs they offer, energy production, farms and ranches, and tribal lands. When I'm asked to describe the district, I always say, you know, the two largest single site employers in Oklahoma are uh, Tinker Air Force Base and Fort Sill Army Post. Uh, and so it's a heavily military district, not just in the, those institution, but also all the private contractors. There are 16,000 civilian jobs to tinker. You know, Boeing has 3,000 people right outside the fence. It's a big energy district. Uh, the two largest oil producing counties when I was elected, and I think they still are, are Carter and Stevens. But, you know, you've got the historic home of Halliburton here. You've got huge energy presence, thousands of producing wells, lots of royalty owners. So that's going to matter. It's got between 13 and 14,000 farms and ranches. So, you know, uh, things like the farm bill, things like uh, the export, uh, it produces over a billion dollars worth of exports that go beyond uh, the continental United States that are agricultural. So, uh, you know, free markets, open markets around the world are very important to Oklahoma farmers and ranchers. Um, I have uh, 11 different Indian tribes that have jurisdiction in some area. They're huge employers uh, and, uh, you know, historic parts of the community. So if you're sitting in this area, you're going to care a lot about Native American issues. I think on Native American issues, I tend to know more than anybody else uh, in the district, partly because I am, partly because probably the largest tribal economy is the Chickasaw. They have 14,000 employees. The great majority of them are in this district largest 
casino in the world sits in my district on the Oklahoma, Texas border, bigger than anything in Las Vegas or Macau. Uh, but they're in a hundred other businesses as well. So again, uh, you know, just over time, you learn a lot and you focus on your district and obviously you try and be helpful in the state. Brandon says she has a plan to fight for three big things in her district, social security and the aging working class, veterans benefits, and getting rid of tax cuts for the wealthy 1%. She believes the privatization of certain areas, like Oklahoma's prison system, has done near irreparable damage to the state and its people, and doesn't want to see that harm brought to Oklahoma veterans. Her brother, a 100% disabled Vietnam veteran, was, quote, eaten alive by Agent Orange, end quote. Brandon has many passions, but says taking care of our country's vets is her biggest. Here is CD4 candidate Mary Brannon on the needs of those living in and around her district. What I plan to fight for, and it's not like CD4 is different from the rest of the state. We have got to make sure that they don't take our Social Security and call it an entitlement. We paid that in. That's our money. It's been collecting interest all these years. And some are not, not getting it till they're 70 now. So you have 40 years that they're using And we have got to make sure that people understand, especially people my age, that they're trying to privatize our Social Security. And we cannot have that. They're trying to make Medicare private. Just look at base housing. Just look at how they messed that up on privatizing. My next big thing is taking the tax cuts back from the rich. It's going to take some political courage in uh, Washington, and I haven't seen a lot of political courage lately. So that's what I want to do. I want to take back the tax cuts where they were. They did not, you know, did not trickle down. They knew it didn't trickle down. And I also want to make sure the VA does not go private and make their hospitals private, because what will happen is people like my brother, bless his heart, who died a slow, painful death, will have nowhere to go. So that is my big thing. I do not want the VA to go private because I do not want the hospitals to be like base housing where they're painting over mold and whenever they're uh, uh, disturbing asbestos dust and the kids are, are breathing it and getting sick on base while their person is deployed to make sure we have freedom. When asked about the things Oklahoma is good at and what can be worked on, Congressman Cole touched on our wind energy efforts and the booming agriculture industry. He then went into detail on various mortality rates in Oklahoma. Yeah, obviously we're good at energy. Uh, you know, some of the most uh, you know innovative uh, uh, energy work in the country's done here, and it's not just classic oil and gas. You know, we're number two in the country in wind power as a percentage of our. So there are things like that. Agriculture again is a especially for us. Some areas where we're not good at, uh, you know, uh, we're terrible in child mortality and uh, maternal mortality. Our rates are some of the worst in the country. But, you know, about 40% or more of your health outcome are literally determined by, uh, okay, what do you eat? Uh, How much do you smoke? What do you drink? You know, we're like at the bottom of all the health indicators that are out there. We have a lot of bad habits. I love chicken fried steak, but it's not the best thing in the world to be eating. Uh, So there are things like that 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 we work on and try to provide a national focus on uh, because you can you can really change. And by the way, that they that's true in most low income communities around the country. Uh, And Oklahoma is uh, it's a fantastic state, but it's still lower than the national average in terms of income education, you know, higher than the national out, uh, averages in terms of outcome, in terms of lifestyle, living, uh, you know, the, uh, lifespan, uh, disease, those kinds of things. So we have a lot of things that, again, we have an interest in solving. They're not unique to us, but they're disproportionate in our communities. Before Mary shared what she believes is good about Oklahoma and what needs to be worked on, she talked about the redistricting that recently took place. It worries me that they're doing so much gerrymandering. I just don't think we should have to worry about our map because what they're doing is they're picking their voters. We're not picking our politicians. 
Mary then shared her disappointment in the lack of possibility of economic growth with new businesses and corporations coming to our state. You know, how come we don't have more um, progress in companies? We, we seem like we're, we've got them and then they, they go someplace else. We need to look at that. Why are they not staying here? I, I went to OU. I think that we have good universities. I think that they are very accepting and they do a lot of good work. Uh, we are a friendly state. We have just got to be more progressive because I worry about um, the poverty level here. We are the lowest. We can't keep teachers. You just pay them too poorly. You know, when you've got teachers like me, you're either um, planning what you're going to teach, teaching it, or grading what you just taught. And then on top of that, you've got these new teachers who have to do all that, have to leave and go to a second job. That is ridiculous. You know, we are 51st in, uh, in, at the bottom of how we treat women. 51st in the States. We don't want to be that. Honestly, Bill, if, if we gave more to education, we could give less to the prison system 10 years later. We've got to treat our teachers like the professionals they are. And we've got to pay them. They, they went to four years of college. They, most of them aren't in it for the money. I know I wasn't. They're doing, doing it because they love kids. we got to love them back or we're going to lose them. Whenever I was a counselor, I had, um, I had children who had parents who were incarcerated, you know, especially if a new kid comes in and they've been like from Granite or some of the others. And um, I don't think people understand when, when you've got somebody in jail, there's somebody's mother or father. And those kids need something from them. And we need to be more um, family oriented, not just that inmate oriented, because if they're going to come out, they need that system. And those kids need to have that contact because they are already scared. You know, it's hard being a teenager. It's hard being an elementary kid and also having a, a parent incarcerated. We've got to work on that. You know, Mabel Bassett, number one in female uh, incarcerations. Just sad. That's why I'm running. For Focus, Black Oklahoma, I'm Jamie Glisson in Norman. You're listening to Focus, Black Oklahoma. Tulsa Arts Organization, A Pocket Full of Hope, makes big moves into a historic building so that youth can share the stage once graced by the greats like Count Basie and Ray Charles. Jasmine Bavar Toby has details on how this organization continues to improve the lives of students in North Tulsa. For over 22 years, A Pocket Full of Hope has been dedicated to the development of middle and high school age youth in North Tulsa through education, life skills, and the performing arts, such as dance, poetry, and acting. The mission of this long-standing organization is to help at-risk youth graduate from high school. Dr. Lester Shaw is the founder of A Pocket Full of Hope. We've been focusing on young people to helping them graduate from high school. We started out talking about at-risk youth, at-risk this, at-risk that. So we decided that we need to, to focus and narrow that at risk of what? And so our focus is at risk of graduating or dropping out of high school. And so we wanted to, to create pathways to help them uh, accomplish that. And as a result, we have a 100% high school graduation rate of the kids who complete our programs. To date, A Pocket Full of Hope has a 100% graduation rate impacting more than 5,000 lives. Sky Freeman, a 2017 graduate of Booker T. Washington, remembers being in the program from seven years of age through high school graduation. Currently, she is earning a certification in cybersecurity and data analytics and attributes her success to the program stating, quote, if it wasn't for a pocket full of hope, I wouldn't know where I would be today. The program taught me to work hard even when things are rough. Show the world what you can do, end quote. In 2007, A Pocket Full of Hope purchased the historic Big Ten Ballroom located off Apache Street in North Tulsa. One of the problems the organization has faced over the years is reserving space for performances of their youth-led shows. Acquiring the Big Ten Ballroom not only provides a consistent performance space, but also allows the program to serve more youth. 
During the 1960s, the Big Ten Ballroom, known as a swanky nightclub for Negroes, was a center point for the North Tulsa community. Dr. Shaw talks about the journey of renovating the ballroom. There was one founder, one foundation who wanted to fund us, but they said, we'll, we'll fund you if you tear down a building and store it over. And of course, politely, I said, uh, no, I don't think we want to do that. Uh, but, you know, I appreciate your suggestion, you know. But I can see he didn't have the vision that I had um, because, you know, you had pigeons flying in here, the trees was growing up. It was horrible, all the floors was, was tore up. And that let me know, because I had seen this building when I was a kid. It was a gas station right next door, a FINA gas station. Mm -hmm. and. We would pull up to the gas station on the way going to church, and there were people still hanging out. You know, uh, it might have been James Brown, because they say he used to stay here after hours and just talk to people about where he'd been, and you know, people didn't want to leave. And uh, so I, I knew right then that vision is not only what you can see in front of you, but what you can see uh, inside of you. It's, it's, in, it's internal and external. And I had the, the opportunity to have an insight on what it used to be, you know, and then have the foresight of what it could be, you know, so uh, vision go both ways. Legendary artists such as Tina Turner, James Brown, Count Basie, Ray Charles, and the original Temptations played at the venue. During segregation, these amazing acts would perform at the Big Ten Ballroom and then stay in the homes of community members as they weren't permitted in the local hotels. It provided them uh, opportunities to live and, and stay with people in the community. They stayed in, people, in a lot of people's houses because, you know, a lot of it was doing segregation. In a lot of places they couldn't, couldn't stay. Uh, one band, I remember, one of the, the owner's daughter, she told us a story about, uh, uh, she couldn't think of what band it was, but uh, I don't know if it's like a Tina Turner band or if it was uh, some other band. Uh, they loved her mother's spaghetti. So, so every time they came, they wanted her to prepare that spaghetti. Shaw believes that this historic element is a great foundation for his participants to connect their future success to greats from the past. Dr. Shaw believes this rich history is a critical tool in empowering young people. The restoration of this legendary ballroom is well underway and completion is expected by November of this year. For Focus Black Oklahoma, I'm Jasmine Bivar Toby in Tulsa. Sun dynamics can be challenging, but when you add girls and snakes, those dynamics can be humbling, especially for the father. G.K. Palmer tells us his story about a kung fu snake. So my son just graduated high school. He's actually going off to college and he's leaving the house. As a father, we want to teach, and that's what we do. We want to make sure that they have enough information that when they go into the world, they're able to conquer. I was in the military for quite a few years. A byproduct of that is that you learn a lot about the outdoors, wilderness, terrain, how to survive in it all. You learn a lot about the outdoors from being in the military. And once again, as a father, I just want to make sure he has all the information that he needs. I've taught him how to be a gentleman. I've taught him his right from his wrongs. I've taught him how to, to obey those that he need to. And this is the last part. I want to teach him how to be able to survive in case something happens. So I walk into his room. Son, let's go for a nature walk. He's like, Dad, why? It's hot outside. I'm like, it's in the 70s. Come on now, let's go for a walk. I can show you all the different types of trees. There's some interesting vegetation. There's all kind of stuff out here in Oklahoma. It's, it's interesting, it's all around you. Under his breath, I hear, boring. Get up, cut the game off, forget Fortnite. You better be standing at the car fully dressed in 10 minutes. And in 10 minutes, there he stood. 
the entire car ride, I'm in full teacher mode. We're going over the importance of maintaining water, how to purify your water. I'm trying to tell him cool things about Oklahoma, like the American buffalo is actually famous here in Oklahoma. Tell him how there's kangaroos that you can find out in the wild. I'm telling him how to be able to, to track these type of things. He is unimpressed, arms folded, huffing and puffing. He can't play Fortnite. Any parent knows this is like torture. Once we arrive at the state park, we unload, there are two people next to us. It's a female about his age and an older woman, her mother, about my age. Ironic, but it's working out perfectly. We get together, we all walk up the same ramp. His mood has dramatically flipped. Oh, he's Mr. Talkative. He has all the jokes. He has all the banter back and forth. The mother-daughter duo, they decide they're gonna walk with us. We're gonna show them all this cool stuff we know. So I'm pointing out trees, I'm pointing out the foliage, I'm pointing out all these things, trying to educate him, who's Mr. All into the girl, trying to act like he knows anything about the outdoors, but we both know he does not. Okay, everybody, this is important. I need everybody to know how to purify your own water. This is me in, in straight teacher mode. I need to know how to, to purify water. You take the water, you cut it here, you do this to it, and in the middle of it, and I reach to grab something. I go to grab this filter, and out of nowhere, the biggest black snake I have ever seen in my life comes flying out of it. Now, this wasn't a normal snake in my mind. This was a terrorist snake. This was a jihadist snake. This snake knew kung fu, karate, taekwondo, and all of that, and he was looking dead at me. I instantly, I go into combat mode. I step back, I gotta think about the women and the kids and everybody here. Even though it's looking at me, I go into my combat mode, all my training kicks in. I scream as loud as I can, I give it my combat kick, and I jump over it. I take off running, I'm running up to the top of the hill, I'm frantic, I'm looking for anybody that I can find to come help. I run up to the top of the hill, and the first people I see are these two elderly ladies. They come running up to me, and they're saying, hey, hey, what's wrong, what's wrong? I'm frantic, I'm yelling for help, I'm looking around for assistance. As they get to me, and they're like, what's going on? I'm like, hey, there's a killer snake, it's down there, it knows kung fu, it has a gun, I don't need to, and as I'm explaining, I realize I'm by myself. There's nobody with me. Not my son, not the daughter, no one. It's just me. And as I realize that I've made a mistake, I look over and I see them walking up the hill. I had realized that I was alone. The combat veteran <laughs> had ran off and left them all. It was awkward because those people that came to help me were in their 80s. And as I look over and I see my son walking up that hill and the look of disbelief in his face, I tried to muster up something to say to him and I couldn't. And as he gets closer to me, we make eye contact and he says, Dad, you ain't have to stiff arm me like that. Focus Black Oklahoma is produced in partnership with KOSU Radio, Tulsa Artist Fellowship, and Tri-City Collective. Additional support is provided by the George Kaiser Family Foundation, the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Philanthropies, and the Zero Families Foundation. Our theme music is by Moffat Music. Focus Black Oklahoma's executive producers are Karesh Ali Lantana and Bracken Clark. Our producers are Nick Alexandrov and Vanessa Gaona. Our production interns are Smriti Iyengar and Torin Doss. Visit us online at kosu.org, tricitycollective.com slash focusblackoklahoma, and YouTube at Tricity Collective. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at focusblackok. You can hear Focus Black Oklahoma on demand for free at kosu.org, NPR One, NPR.org, or wherever you get your podcasts. Did you know KOSU accepts vehicles as a form of support? You get a tax deduction, and we'll take care of the rest. Visit KOSU.org or call 855-277-2346.